Good afternoon and welcome again to the future of capital markets in the digital age. Today, we're pleased to have with us Executive Director of BC Group, Dave Chapman. Thank you very much, Ian. Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, good morning, good day, or good evening, uh, and welcome to our webinar, uh, The Future of Capital Markets in the Digital Age. Uh, on behalf of BC Group and OSL, uh, I'm delighted to have you with us today. Uh, we're all very conscious of uh, Zoom fatigue in a post-COVID-19 world, uh, so appreciate you spending your time with us uh, all the more. Uh, by way of introductions, uh, my name is Dave Chapman. As Ian stated, I'm an executive director at BC Group. Uh, prior to focusing full-time on uh, the digital assets space, I was uh, an investment banker and I worked at the likes of HSBC, ABN EMRO, Barclays Capital, Credit Suisse and a whole suite of others. Uh, upon discovering Bitcoin uh, for my sins in 2013 and going down that rabbit hole, um, I, I left investment banking behind me and alongside uh, two business partners and an incredible team uh, have been building successful businesses in the digital asset space ever since. Uh, BC Group is a fintech company listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and it's the, the parent company to our digital assets platform business OSL. Uh, OSL is Asia's leading digital asset platform and provides products and services of the highest standards. Its core offering is uh, institutional digital asset brokerage exchange and custody services, all within the digital asset space uh, and servicing a, a non-retail demographic. Uh, our typical counterparts are professional investors, high net worth individuals, funds, family officers, asset managers, investment banks, investment and private banks, corporates, the like. Um, the group has a team of around 150 staff globally, uh, and we maintain a presence in Hong Kong, Singapore, Mexico, and the Philippines. Uh, but that's enough about us. Let's move on as to why you're really with us today. Um, the obligatory uh, boring legal stuff, uh, please note that this presentation is for information purposes only. Uh, it does not represent uh, financial advice. So capital markets of the future uh, will be digital. Uh, never before have we been more confident uh, about this statement. But you know, what, what does that mean behind the buzzwords? You know, one can argue that this is hardly a bold statement, considering that finance is already digital. We already have mass adoption of digital finance. We leverage services like internet banking, contactless stored value, smart cards, mobile payments and more. But our thesis is quite simple. The advent and adoption of innovative new technologies and products, particularly tokenized securities, we believe will drive such transformation. Uh, furthermore, said transformation is supported by the emergence of virtual banks, uh, central bank digital currencies, uh, the continued adoption of public blockchain currencies, the tokenization of traditional securities, and notwithstanding additional improvements in financial inclusion, uh, continued globalization, and of course, notwithstanding the wider internet accessibility. Uh, today's presentation is intended to provide you a glimpse into the future of capital markets and how this will have radical impl implications for all of us. Um, whilst it's not the core focus of this presentation, it's important to note that blockchain, although somewhat overhyped in the last few years, uh, still remains the key underlying technology facilitating the advancement in capital markets. And it will eliminate many of the frictions that have long plagued the transfer of private, listed, and non-listed alternative assets. And it's going to offer greater opportunity, efficiency, liquidity to investors and issuers. It's acting as the backbone for our discussion of efficient, new, lower cost and secure ways for capital to be transferred and allocated between actors across the financial system. By extension, these new products provide unique opportunities for investors to, de to deploy funds into asset classes previously unavailable with return profiles different from those obtained from traditional asset portfolios. Um, this is a good opportunity to note, to note that wealth managers, family officers, traditional portfolio managers um, can all obtain first and early mover advantage by rapidly educating themselves about these assets and, that's what sh and, and the assets that are likely to, to prevail. And that's the primary purpose or one of the purposes of today's uh, presentation. Um, we'll also cover in some detail the current regulatory landscape. Regulatory clarity is critical uh, in this picture, and it's one of the dependencies uh, required for this asset class to develop and mature. Um, put frankly, without a rule book, uh, most firms will, will not com contemplate any participation at all. Uh, finally, it wouldn't be uh, a Zoom 2020 meeting uh, unless we actually talked about COVID. 
so we'll uh, we'll end the meeting, uh, end the presentation uh, with the impact of COVID and what it's having on the wider adoption, the wider adoption of, of digital assets as a whole. So, first and foremost, you know, what are we referring to uh, when we use the term digital assets? You know, the, the term digital assets originated in the mid 1990s and it referred to items such as videos, images, audio and, and documentation. Uh, and things really didn't change much for the next 20 years until the introduction of Bitcoin and blockchain technology, which in turn enabled the creation of a range of new financial products and instruments, including stable coins, security tokens, central bank digital currencies. And it was with these technological advance, advances um, that they were given the term digital assets. And then, you know, digital assets became a much broader uh, definition. So for those that aren't so familiar with digital assets, uh, let's have a, 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 a quick refresher. Uh, Bitcoin, it entered the scene 11 years ago in, in 2009. Uh, it was the world's first truly decentralized peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Uh, Bitcoin was the first blockchain technology that the world had ever seen. Um, it does benefit from the first mover advantage. Uh, it's the most thoroughly battle-hardened cryptocurrency to date, and it currently maintains a whopping 65% dominance in comparison to all other cryptocurrencies combined. Uh, we have the wider crypto market. So whilst Bitcoin was first, there are actually now over 5,500 cryptocurrencies in circulation with a combined market capitalization of around $250 billion. Uh, this category includes well-known brands such as Ethereum and Ripple. Uh, we believe uh, that there will be a significant consolidation in the number of crypto initiatives that continue to, to be supported. And thus, you know, many of the five and a half thousand tokens that we see uh, may well and truly be worthless. Um, we went through a phase in you know, that really came to life in 2017, 2018 called initial coin offerings. You know, it was, uh, it's also falling within that crypto segment and it's sometimes referred to as Kickstarter, Kickstarter on steroids. Uh, put very bluntly, uh, there was no faster way to, to raise capital during that 17-18 period than to perform an initial coin offering. Uh, it was also the primary driver in pushing the entire crypto market cap to over $800 billion uh, before many of the projects and initiatives uh, succumbed to non-delivery, project exits, and in some cases, fines and jail time for those that had ignored security regulations. Which is a good segue to bring us on to security token offerings, the primary purpose of this presentation today. So STOs or STs, security tokens, also referred to as digital securities. Um, they're a tokenized digital form of traditional security, uh, such as real estate, venture capital, private equity, physical assets, hedge funds, many others. Uh, we uh, really believe that security tokens will play a significant part in the future of capital markets. Uh, we can talk about stable coins. Um, traditionally, stable coins were crypto tokens that were designed to eliminate uh, volatility by backing these tokens with an asset or fiat currency that remains stable. For example, the US dollar, though I guess uh, it's quite controversial as to whether that's remaining stable over, <laughs> over the past few months. Um, whilst stable coins are commonplace uh, to the crypto community, uh, the term made much wider mainstream notice uh, last year with the announcement of Libra. Uh, Libra is the, the, the stable coin that's being proposed originally by, by Facebook and, and then since onto the wider foundation. Um, Libra is, is not strictly a, a cryptocurrency as it does not operate on a, on a public blockchain, uh, but regardless of the varying type of stablecoin, uh, they're all intended to be fairly stable to enable payments and remittance services without the volatility of, of cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin. Uh, and then finally, the last on the list, uh, CBDCs, um, a long word for central bank digital currencies. Uh, it is the digital form of fiat money, uh, fiat being a currency that's established as money by a government regulator, uh, monetary authority, or, or frankly, law. Um, a central bank digital currency is a high security digital instrument. What does that mean? It's like a paper note, okay? It's like cash in some respects. Um, it can be used as a means of payment, uh, a unit of account, or a store of value. And just like paper notes, uh, each unit is uniquely identifiable uh, to prevent counterfeiting. Um, Digital assets really is the first new asset class uh, one could argue that we've had in the last 30 years. Uh, unsurprisingly, digital assets are still tiny in comparison to traditional assets, but we believe uh, it has the potential to disrupt and grow both rapidly in pace and radically in value uh, during the, the current decade. And there's a number of, of, of driving factors behind this predicted growth, including, including 
the continued wider acceptance of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency. Uh, Bitcoin was seen as something, you know, a little bit of a fad, uh, a little bit of a taboo, uh, but we are seeing the continued wider adoption of such. Uh, we are seeing a shift to digital fiat currency, and we'll touch on that later today, uh, where it's the introduction of digital securities to complement existing capital raising markets, hence security tokens, uh, continued and further regulatory clarity. Um, and let's not forget the fact that banking and payments, uh, asset management, insurance, you know, uh, wealth management, uh, all continue to be further disrupted by fintech. And then finally, uh, for some of us on, on, on the call today, they, they, they fall into this category. Unfortunately, I do not. Uh, the, the, the proliferation of the, the born digital generation. So there's many investable digital asset products available for retail and institutional investors today. Um, of course, Bitcoin still remains the most well-known and utilized. It's everyone's uh, favorite digital asset. It's interesting to note that if you consider empirical data from the past 10 years, uh, Bitcoin has largely uh, been uncorrelated with equities, uh, fixed income, oil, um, and others. And it should also be noted that Bitcoin was the best performing asset of the last decade. And it's also one of the best in investments to date in 2020. Um, a lot of people do forget that. Uh, a lot of people, obviously it is a high risk asset and it is very volatile, uh, but facts remain that it was the best performing investment of the last decade. Um, and it's on path to, to being uh, pretty performing, performing very well this year as well. Um, with an increasing appetite for risk hedging uh, combined with the normalization of cryptocurrencies as an investment vehicle, this means that we're likely to see that the price of Bitcoin uh, to continue to perform. Um, and of course, as the world has grappled with severe economic uh, fallout from COVID-19, um, the price um, of Bitcoin, uh, albeit very volatile, has been on uh, one hell of a, of a bull run, uh, surging more than 100% since the lows we, we, we endured in, in March. Um, you know, we believe that this resilience and outperformance demonstrates that it is here to stay. Um, it has a life of its own soon, and it's not subject to the same forces that govern mainstream finance. Um, and as a result of this uncorrelation and its continued resilience, uh, what we're seeing is investors are finding it difficult to continue to ignore Bitcoin or, or, and, and not have any exposure to it at all. Um, what's also facilitated that argument is the unlimited QE from central banks. Uh, it's also driving many investors to see Bitcoin as an inflation hedge. Um, very importantly as well uh, to, to note, and I guess that's why we're almost at 100 participants to today, is that there is still opportunity for funds, wealth managers, multifamily officers, uh, you know, uh, high net worth individuals, professional investors to obtain early mover or, or first mover advantage uh, by adopting digital assets um, in an investment capability. And it's one of the reasons why we're, we're hosting this webinar today. You know, we play a role in educating and, and training, uh, not only uh, in, in addition to providing access uh, to this new asset class. So uh, everyone's favorite topic, I did this up uh, first and foremost to try and get it out of the, out of the way. I, I seem to lose participants sometimes when we talk about regulation, but uh, like it, loathe it or, or love it, uh, it plays an, an important part uh, in the journey of, of digital assets. Um, and most of the major jurisdictions around the world uh, have regulated or are planning to regulate digital assets. Um, and whilst Bitcoin has been around for over a decade, it's only relatively recently that we've observed significant interest in digital assets from central banks, governments, regulators alike. Um, and conversely, you know, their views have, have changed. You know, their views have changed, their outlook has changed dramatically in the, in the last decade. And you know, there's some examples um, that, that I'd like to share. And some examples include that they've largely, you know, when I say they, I'm, I'm talking about governments, regulators, um, law enforcement, central bodies, they've largely won um, accepted the fact that decentralized technologies such as Bitcoin and cryptocurrency are here to stay and that they've, they've, they've come to the realization that in some cases it's actually very difficult to stop um, and with such a realization they're quickly formula formulating a view on how to regulate this sector. I think the, the original view was let's ban it um, for, some for some jurisdictions. Uh, they've since done a, a U-turn on that and they, they've come to the view that they, they need to place regulation around this sector because it's very difficult to stop. Uh, secondly, uh, that they've largely accepted that uh, digital assets have the potential to pose significant benefits, not only to their populations, but more so to central banks. Um, the primary benefits being improved taxation enforcement, surveillance, uh, traceability, big data, 
And we're now starting to see central bank digital currencies emerge globally uh, with uh, China's DCEP, their Digital Currency Electronic Payment Initiative, already be, being piloted. Um, and three, you know, they've largely accepted the fact that the tokenization of securities is going to mature and provide a means to complement existing capital markets businesses and furthermore provide benefits such as increased liquidity, fractional ownership, tighter compliance, improved settlements and transparency, many other factors. Um, and it's for all these reasons that we're seeing innovative regulators such as the SFC in Hong Kong introduce licensing to satisfy uh, this transformation. And one last point before I move off this slide is that it's important to note uh, that uh, the financial Financial Action Task Force, uh, or the, the, the FATF, you know, that's the global body uh, whose objectives are to prevent money laundering and, and terrorism financing. They've recently turned its spotlight on cryptocurrency last year. Um, this directive, uh, known as the travel rule, uh, it'll force, it'll force uh, the crypto sector into compliance uh, with traditional banking regulations on crypto exchanges, ATS, you know, uh, wallet providers, uh, and, and what they will have to do is divulge personal information on people using their services. Um, I guess it's, it's, a, it's akin to the sender and beneficiary information attached to a bank transfer. Um, such information would also uh, be required when sending uh, crypto transfers. Um, I'm, I'm sure that, that some, are, some are shocked on this, on this call to hear that uh, Bitcoin is, is moving away from its originating and somewhat libertarian views. Um, however, it's clear uh, that regulatory clarity, among other factors, is definitely required for institutional adoption. Uh, and such regulatory clarity is coming thick and fast uh, as regions accept the fact that this asset class is not going away. Uh, and the sooner that they harness, uh, you know, that they are able to control and, and in place regulations around this asset class, it's the sooner that those same regions can leverage it for economic growth and stimulation. A few more uh, myths uh, with respect to uh, digital assets that I'd like to have the opportunity to, to debunk. Um, licensing in Hong Kong uh, is geared towards institutional adoption, uh, as it is in, in some other regions, making it easier for companies and professionals to deal with licensed entities, uh, whether they uh, be asset managers, brokers, dealers, or operators of, of automated trading services. Uh, it should be noted that, that the licenses only cater servicing uh, professional investors, and this does not include retail, which you know, admittedly has been the largest segment uh, of the crypto space to date. And it should also be observed that the existing licensing in some regions may already satisfy some participation in this space. For example, uh, the Type 9 uh, Asset Management License in Hong Kong actually allows uh, for up to 10% of a fund to invest into crypto uh, without any additional accreditation. Uh, another myth we always hear is uh, we hear that Bitcoin is too risky when it comes to AML. Um, in addition to the, the information that's displayed on screen, I mean, digital assets are starting to prove themselves to be safe and secure. And we're, it's evidenced uh, by the increased number of quality custodians in this space, as well as the robust and thorough KYC and AML requirements taken up by, the, the, by most of the professional firms uh, that are operating in this asset class. Um, you know, technological advancements, um, you know, contrary to popular belief, allow someone like OSL, for example, to screen every single coin or token entering our platform. And we can actually assign a, a risk score in real time uh, to determine whether that digital asset has been tainted with dark web, gambling, exchange theft, ransomware activity, the, the, the whole shebang. Um, if it's determined that that transfer is indeed tainted uh, and has a, a, a risk score that we deem unacceptable, we can actually quarantine that digital asset in a, uh, in a separate wallet, allowing us the flexibility to do a number of things, whether that be inform law, enfor inform law enforcement, uh, submit a, a specific transaction report, um, or actually even return the digital asset uh, back to its originating sending address, uh, depending on the circumstance. And then lastly, another myth that's, that's, uh, that's uh, a popular one is that there is a concern around holding digital assets in a, in a, in a very secure manner. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest and say that, um, you know, this sector doesn't uh, maintain the best reputation for holding client assets. Uh, we continually hear about exchange marketplaces having succumbed to an exchange hack uh, and in, in some cases millions of dollars of client funds um, being emptied. However, it, it's rapidly improving uh, to a point where professional custody solutions do exist now, uh, and such solutions are actually audited and insured. 
Um, regulatory licensing regimes will require such uh, now, or it will definitely require uh, such in the near future. Moving on from myths, um, it's just a reminder that, you know, you know, one of the reasons why we have people on the call today is to learn more about digital assets. Um, that being said, um, one of the biggest myths of all is that no one in traditional finance is getting involved. Um, some of the most, some of the world's most prominent investment professionals and household finance brands are now involved in this space. Uh, and that has seen a, a real aggressive uptick in the last 12 months. Uh, for example, the, the majority of, of the headlines displayed on, on, on the screen right now were published less than, than a month ago. Uh, and I'll admit also, it did always used to be about blockchain, uh, and, but that's not really the case anymore. Uh, now we're seeing the adoption of you know, true uh, digital assets like Bitcoin, public uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, security tokens, stable coins, Libra. Um, so it's definitely evolving and it's evolving very fast. Um, I guess also worthy to point out that the risk in being first in what has typically been warranted as a high risk sector made little sense uh, for a lot in traditional finance. Um, however, entering the sector now, it's defendable merely because a lot of your competition has already made that leap. Uh, and in, in a very relative short span of time, uh, the narrative has changed um, in traditional finance from one of dismissal and rejection to one of increased interest and adoption. And, and some of that interest and adoption is being driven by uh, consumer demand. You know, it's, it's their customers that are saying we want access to this product. And some of it is being purely driven by my, my, my competition is doing it. Uh, I can't miss the boat. Uh, I, I need to jump on. Um, also, another thing that has happened, you know, over the last probably 12 months is that there's an increasing, um, increasingly constructive narrative in financial media towards crypto. Uh, it's also chipping away at that perceived risk. You know, from a media's perspective, cr crypto is also always seen as a, a very negative um, asset class. Um, but you know, over the tw last 12 months, you know, largely because we're seeing some very big players enter this space, um, you know, we're seeing uh, the, the views and perception from from media improve. And I'd say the overall amount by by which one would be reaching their neck out to participate is decreasing gradually. Um, you know, it goes without saying that we anticipate uh, some truly game-changing announcements to be made by traditional powerhouse, by traditional financial powerhouse brands uh, before the conclusion of 2020. Um, I'm not a betting man, uh, but I'm happy to place a wager on that prediction. So we talked about the existing, uh, we talked about the traditional finance entering, um, but it's also worthy to, to remind people and make note that the existing digital asset ecosystem is, is pretty robust um, and it can support the development and the innovation that is, that is already underway. Um, and so whilst we've only really started to see the green shoots of traditional finance entering the dig digital asset space now, it, it's worth noting that it does have some pretty damn strong uh, foundations. You know, institutionalization is happening and we're seeing it firsthand here in Hong Kong and, and across the wider region. Um, you know, personally and historically, there have been two main factors that have prevented uh, wider participation from traditional finance and, uh, and some of which, and we've already touched briefly on, but as a reminder, it really is, is, is twofold um, out of those many factors. One is the lack of regulatory clarity. Uh, we've seen queues of institutions wanting to participate, but they've been waiting on the sidelines for the playbook. And that playbook is now being provided by innovators, innovative regulators globally. And as already discussed, this includes very specific regulation in both Hong Kong and in Singapore. And as I stated previously, contrary to popular belief, KYC and AML guidelines have existed and are mandatory uh, to impose such. Uh, it's commonplace across the industry and, and furthermore enforced by regulations. And secondly, uh, the, the lack of quality custodians, you know, the, the safekeeping of funds has been an issue for the digital asset space for quite some time. Uh, but we are now seeing a growing number of participants solve this problem uh, with both insured and, and audited custodian services. And this really provides the, the level of security and confidence that a, a traditional uh, physical world custodian would. Um, you know, and, and another, uh, a couple of other things to consider is that Bitcoin's no longer really considered a, a social experiment. Uh, it definitely was a social experiment 11 years ago, uh, but as a result of it, you know, going the test of time, uh, uh, having regulatory clarity, and as a result of financial heavyweights entering this uh, sector, uh, we're now actually seeing a growing number of inquiries and engagements from tr traditional finance. And, and the most popular inquiries 
and engagements that we have are, are really based around a number of things. One is custody. You know, how do we secure, uh, how do we securely store and, and manage digital assets? It's execution. How do we route orders to your brokerage desk? And then thirdly, it's about our platform. How do we, how do we leverage your, your software as a service platform so we can offer the same thing to our customers? And then lastly, it's worth noting uh, that transaction banking services, you know, one of the most difficult challenges to secure historically uh, are now being afforded to those who operate in a regulatory compliant framework. Uh, newsworthy to everyone, I'm sure, on the call, uh, we witnessed a fortnight ago that JP, JP Morgan announced that it would provide banking services to two regulated crypto exchanges in the US. Uh, and to that extent, you know, we anticipate more household banking names staking their claim in the, in the digital asset space throughout the remainder of this year. Okay, um, we'll shake it up a bit and talk a little bit about uh, security tokens. Okay, so um, considering that the large audience, um, we'll do a little bit of a refresher. So firstly, uh, before we talk about what is a security token, uh, let's talk about what is a token. So what is a token? A token is a representation of something uh, in its particular ecosystem. Uh, it could be membership, uh, product redemption, utility, uh, voting rights, uh, anything. Uh, a token is not limited uh, to one particular role. And it should be noted that tokens were what made ICOs or initial coin offerings um, so popular. Okay, so that's a token. Secondly, what's a, what is a security? Okay, so securities can represent an ownership position in a publicly traded corporation like VC Group, uh, accredited a relationship with a governmental body or rights to ownership as represented by uh, an option, uh, for example. So if we've talked about tokens and we've talked about what is a security, uh, what is a security token? Um, in its purest form, a security token is simply a tokenized digital form of traditional securities. Uh, and they do offer a number of, of, of advantages of which I'll discuss over the, the next, uh, next few slides. Um, digitizing securities through blockchain technology enables cost savings, economic value creation and, and risk reductions. Um, security token offerings are a new form of, of capital raising and part of the broader emerging trend of, digi of digital securities uh, and tokenization. Um, the same security token offerings enable low cost, secure and immutable equity capital market transactions to bring allocations and recipients of capital together. Um, and because of their you know, relatively low cost of issuance, uh, businesses that have been too small to tap traditional equity capital markets through IPOs can access equity capital uh, through STOs. You know, a lot of the time when we look at IPOs, the, 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 the border to entry or the, the, you know, the, the requirements um, either are, are too comprehensive, too uh, high in value. And we're starting to see uh, a lot of that friction being reduced uh, by security tokens and security token offerings. Um, why are, we're not suggesting uh, security token offerings uh, will dominate capital markets in the near future, uh, but they will certainly meaningful, meaningfully complement existing capital, capital raising markets that exist today. Uh, and they'll afford a number of advantages as they mature over time. And so whilst I leave those benefits displayed on screen, I'll talk about a, a, a few other ones. Um, you know, some of the benefits around security token offerings uh, my first one that I'll discuss is it's actually bringing, bringing some credibility back to this sector. Uh, and not a lot of people like to talk about this. Uh, similar to the technology sector with the dot-com bubble, um, the digital asset space uh, had its own dot-com bubble uh, when it was rampant with initial coin offerings. And, and for the most part, you know, they caused significant losses to ICO participants. So, you know, an, an increase in regulation and an increase in consumer protection is a good, good thing for this space. Uh, given uh, the ICO bubble that we endured. Uh, another benefit is a reduction in inter intermediaries, thus improvements in traditional finance uh, with reduced fees, uh, significantly faster execution. Um, by that, I mean by removing the intermediaries, securities will have faster execution time uh, for the successful issuance of security tokens themselves. Um, security token offerings will have a much larger addressable market as a result of fractional ownership and increased access to issuing properties. Uh, platforms and secondary markets. And then lastly, um, one of the other remaining benefits is a potential reduction in institutional uh, manipulation as a result of reduction in middlemen and as a result of transparency that's achieved through block blockchain and, and smart contracts. Uh, 
Um, we've talked a lot about some of the advantages already. Um, digital securities eliminate many of the frictions that have long plagued uh, the transfer of, of private and non-listed alternative assets, as I said previously in the presentation. Um, it's going to provide a, a greater opportunity, better efficiency and liquidity to investors and issuers alike. Uh, blockchain will save both time and money. Uh, the core strengths of blockchain technology include uh, a shared ledger, immutability, security, and they, they bring the promise of reduced transaction costs uh, along with uh, a streamlined processes to the industry. Um, you know, security tokens, utility tokens, cryptocurrency, payment tokens, they all bring efficiency to the transfer of value. Um, and that value can be really in the form of a payment, uh, access to the platform or, or rights to an asset. Um, security tokens do address the issues uh, for some large markets. Um, we believe for, for, for tokenized venture capital funds, as an example, uh, shorter holding periods will attract more LPs uh, and with easier exit opportunities um, from share like tokens, the venture capitals uh, themselves will, will potentially invest even more. Um, asset backed tokens uh, allow industries uh, such as the $54 trillion commercial real estate industry to be tokenized. Um, local governments are exploring uh, the benefits of security tokens uh, as with crypto bonds from the $3.8 trillion uh, municipal uh, bond market. And when we talk about um, you know, some of these examples of, of what can be potentially unlocked, it's not, it's not just a case of its potential. Um, you know, we're seeing established uh, global institutions already uh, conducting STOs. Um, this is a slide uh, from PwC's security token offering strategic perspectives report last year. Uh, and, and similar to the, the previous slides demonstrating, uh, demonstrating traditional finance participation in, in the wider digital asset space, uh, the, the same is, is starting to apply to the security token segment. We're talking about COVID. Um, we're nearing the end of the webinar before we, we come to our conclusions and open it up for Q&A today. Um, and as I said, it, it wouldn't be a 2020 Zoom without commenting on, on COVID-19. Um, you know, COVID-19 is, is most definitely accelerating uh, the erosion of trust uh, in some fiat currencies and it's hastening the, the interest uh, in, and institutional adoption of digital currencies themselves. Um, you know, we believe that the increased demand uh, from this uh, coupled with the impact of, of Corona is likely to catalyze uh, the, the wider digitization of currencies, markets and, and societies. Um, and, you know, as I stated previously with respect to central bank uh, digital currencies, um, in the recent weeks and months, we've seen central banks do just that. Um, digital assets regulation is a race to the moon for governments. Uh, and, you know, payment tokens and security tokens, we, we believe, are really poised to take off. Um, what has become abundantly clear uh, for well-established jurisdictions uh, like Hong Kong um, is that cash is, is no longer king. Uh, and finally, you know, to, to quote Paul Tudor-Jones recently, you know, the, the most compelling argument for owning a digital asset like Bitcoin is the coming digitization of currencies uh, everywhere, uh, which is also accelerated by COVID-19. Our conclusions today is that digital assets have evolved into a highly liquid uh, financial products and they represent the, the first new asset class in 30 years. Uh, we believe that the digital asset investment landscape is highly sophisticated and the asset class can be seen as an uncorrelated hedge against inflation. Global regulation has created the right conditions for institutional investors to enter the space and help eliminate barriers to entry. Traditional finance has taken note. Uh, they're stepping up and they're participating uh, at a rapid pace. Um, the sector's existing ecosystem has created healthy competition and innovation. Uh, security token offerings and tokenized securities are the future of capital markets. It's starting slow, but we anticipate that to pick up in the very near future. And then finally, COVID-19 has accelerated digital asset adoption and brought its drivers to the forefront. Um, a, a few other points before we, we open the call uh, for, for Q&A. You know, we believe that the regulatory clarity that we've witnessed over the past uh, you know, 12 to 24 months will continue. Uh, security tokens are coming, uh, but they will take time. That's the same for the, the, the central bank digital currencies. Uh, Bitcoin continues to dominate uh, for now, uh, and the opportunity is still new. Uh, and then what is the size of the addressable market? Um, the, the current market capitalization for this sector is tiny, uh, and there is an enormous amount of opportunity. 
if we look at every other asset class or sector that has gone digital, uh, and then to think that what we've predicted or what we've what we're witnessing right now will not continue at a rapid pace, uh, we see that as quite a quite a closed uh, closed view. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, we do think that digital assets has the potential to disrupt. Um, and grow both rapidly and radically in, in value during this current decade. And then finally, uh, you know, asset managers, wealth managers, uh, and anyone that's really allocating assets will grow market share, acquire additional clients and investors, and will produce uh, superior alpha um, and returns by understanding and adopting digital assets uh, into their investments. Um, the, the market will continue to evolve very rapidly. Um, if, and as for example, uh, we discussed that COVID has expedited that, that rapid change. And so traditional finance sectors who adopt, who educate, uh, who participate, um, they're the ones that are most likely to benefit. Uh, to that extent, uh, thank you for your time today. And back to you, Ian. Thank you, Dave. If you have more questions you want to ask, uh, hopefully we've piqued your interest, maybe hit a nerve, um, or certainly uh, created some demand to bring some of this conversation back into your own organizations. And certainly OSL would be happy to help you on this journey in one way, shape or form. Um, so with that, uh, on behalf of OSL, thank you all for attending the call. Thank you, Dave, for investing the time with us as well and, and sharing and giving us your insights. Um, Please have an enjoyable rest of your days, um, but also be on the lookout for more events of this nature uh, from OSL on the horizon. We certainly will have, have more. And for regular updates, um, I'd encourage you to uh, follow us on social media. You can scan the QR codes in the bottom of your screen or go to at osl.com uh, across most of our, our social handles. Um, and be sure to sub subscribe to our Trade Review newsletter, which comes out daily and has a lot of uh, great insights into the market uh, daily and some of the things that we see from our desk that you will not get elsewhere. And certainly uh, some of our long form content on the OSL Insights page at www.osl.com. So until then, stay safe, have enjoyable afternoon, and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you.